Don't try to sneak into your room like that. I know what you've got behind your back. Records. More no records. Okay, we're in Oxnard, California. We'll wait till he's walking Ixnay out. Ixnay at the Oxnard. And this is Fidelity Record Pressing in Oxnard, California on Factory Lane. And we're going to go in now okay. and, and meet the Hashimoto's father and son. Oh, look who's there. Oh, Edward Hi, Hashimoto. Michael. Good How to see you. you. Good to see you. Is it open door policy? I'm allowed in? Uh, just for you. And there's Rick. Hey there, Michael. Good to see you, man. We've known each other for like 40 years or something probably at this point. Good morning. Amazing. Okay. So this is where you, this is where you have, what is this all here? This is. So this is kind of the warehouse. This is where we store all of the, the jackets and other, other items that are needed for, for pressing records. It's a very big space too. Yeah. Well, okay, we'll show you some of the, the fancier things. Okay. So how long has this been open now? So we've been actually pressing records since about January, February. Okay. But really we haven't been going what resembles full production till April, April, May. It takes a lot longer than people think to get up it, and running and actually making, it's hard, it's difficult, correct? It's involved. <laughs> There's involved. a lot to it. It's yeah. a lot of hard work uh, and it takes a lot of determination and dedication to be able to get it all done. I'm sure. And how difficult was it for you in this area to uh, to get all the uh, environmental regulations taken care of? Because I, I drove up here and it's all uh, agriculture and you're growing mm -hmm. tomatoes and all, you know, so they're very well, covetous they, of, of the environment. Yeah, right? absolutely. That, oh, and it's an important to us and important to everybody here, yeah. I think, in California. And I wouldn't say it was difficult. The only thing that made it difficult was that around here they're so used to dealing with the agriculture that we're kind of an anomaly and they didn't know what to do with us. Right. So that was kind of the biggest challenge with that is kind of explaining to the process and saying, oh no, we're not dumping water or anything like that because that's kind of what they're used to. Yeah. Um, we're not spraying chemicals or anything, so. Um, and you don't do plating here, which is, which is and, Yeah, we don't do plating here. So, and, but even that, it's not that bad because you just collect everything and ship it off to yeah. the uh, to, to another state. To, no, no, they'll take care of it here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, isolate everything. All right. So we'll walk back. We'll show you the the boiler first. Okay. So we'll get back to it as well. But we did uh, build uh, some quality control rooms. So we've got records here, packed records already. No, these are all jackets. Jackets. Yeah, we try to get the records out as soon as we press them. Nobody likes them sitting around. So. Stoughton, I see Stoughton old tip on jackets. Okay. So we've been, uh, we added QC rooms. So we have these built out. They're not listening rooms, they're QC rooms. Yeah. So they're not fantastic audio wise, right. but they get the job done. So we're coming up. We found Jim. Part of work. We put him to work as often as we can. <laughs> we have our uh, drying oven for the labels there. So what was this space before you guys took it over, do you know? Uh, most recently, it was used for, I think it was for extensively for bell pepper packaging. Bell pepper packaging. Bell pepper packaging. So it was used for a long time for that. And before that, actually this building and the, uh, a couple more buildings down was used by Borg Warner, GE, and they did plastic compounding. They did, uh, there was a glass tempering factory here at one point. So it's been used for a bunch of things. Yeah. And actually the building, you'll have to get it a good shot of it out here. It was the original site of the sugar beet factory, which is what Oxnard was built around. Because it looked, that building next door looked very, very ostentatious and mm -hmm. yeah. almost like a, something out of a film. So, yeah, it's, this, this, uh, this area has been in use for since 19, or excuse me, 1888. Wow. So I've seen pictures of this building next door, which we can kind of see uh, from 1919. So it's at least that old. So we have our air compressors. Air compressors and boiler, boiler system. So we have two 50 horsepower Mira boilers. Um, it's obviously very efficient and modern compared to some of the other pressing plants. Yeah. Where they have these big old things that look like steam engines. Yeah. Well, that's the Muras, they're Japanese designs. Uh, they just recently actually started building them in the US. Um, but yeah, they're, they're very, very efficient. They're much more efficient than kind of the standard boilers that are used. 
It generates steam very quickly, and it, it can also be very, very consistent. And of course, in this environment, you can have them outside, almost outside and not worry about. Yeah, we don't really have to worry about weather here. Yeah, that's, that's one of that's the great. one of the nice things. So we do have a nice roof covering everything. Um, we added all of that. The lighting is temporary. Yeah. Work in progress. I love that the fact that everything's new and clean and nice. Mm -hmm. We're gonna try to keep it that way as well. And we also we tried to kind of do two of everything that made sense. Yeah. So that way we ha always have backups. That way we never have to worry about being being down for very long. And it also gives us some room to, to grow. Yeah. Right. Well. You've got lots of space there if, if, you, if the business yeah. really gets hot. Yeah. All right, let's, let's move on. Uh, how much maintenance is required with this? It pretty much runs itself? Um, no, no, it takes constant maintenance. Yeah. It's really the, the water. Uh, taking care of the water and keeping up on that and making sure the water going into it is clean um, and treat it properly. And so you can't take just tap water and put it in there. You gotta do reverse no, we get, you gotta So we run soft water and uh, deionized water tanks right. to make sure we have the purest water going in there that we can. Uh, and then we treat it with chemicals to prevent corrosion and uh, we don't have anything to control uh, bio growth here, but for the cooling tower we do as well. Nice. Okay. Air compressors, we have our air compressor tanks. This is another thing that seems, you know, a lot of people neglect, yeah. but we have, we set all of this up to have very, very clean and dry air. So we run it through what we call a wet tank where it gets rid of most of the condensation, and then we run it through a dryer and then we have a, a dry tank to be able to store that clean, dry air. We also have the filters up there. And, and that just helps keep the equipment running smoothly so we don't have issues with that. this company from Quincy? You know? um, it's one of those conglomerates. I think they're in Georgia. No, I think their headquarters is like Georgia. Yeah, they have businesses all over. I believe it's part of Atlas Copco, which is a big... Okay, so uh, now here we have uh, dry, uh, labels. Are these all dried already? Uh, yeah. So we try to dry them as soon as they come in. Okay. As you can see what's coming out here. Uh, they got uh, Jack Johnson, David Crosby, and, uh, no, there's no news here that I'm going to be showing, right? No, uh, not there. There's some other ones we probably don't want you to see yet, but Taylor Swift. Uh, no, no Taylor Swift yet. A lot of labels. Here. Not to say we wouldn't do Taylor Swift, but Why I don't. Not? I don't foresee us. I would uh, do Taylor Swift, but I'm too old and she's taken. Oh, did I say that? <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. We would do her records. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah, there we go. I'm sorry. So then we come out to the the pressing room. Uh, we'll come back to that. Yeah. We can go look at the cooling tower. Okay. Get a little sneak peek. Here it is. So this is our cooling tower. And so one of the nice things about being in this area is we don't have to worry about extreme heat or extreme cold. Um, and so we're, we're able to utilize a cooling tower instead of a big expensive uh, power hungry chiller. Um, the only issue with the tower is sometimes you get dirty water. And again, we don't want dirty water running through the presses. Yep. So if you want to come around to the other side. Does it ever rain here? Occasionally. This, this isn't affected by rain? No, no, these are designed to be outside. You'll find these everywhere all across the country, uh, usually on top of buildings and things like that. Yep. They have them back at Disneyland, all hidden from view. Um, but we run everything through a uh, heat exchanger. So we have the process water running through the machines, and then that runs through the heat exchanger, which is getting cooled by the cooling tower water. So that way we're able to really accurately maintain the water and keep it clean, which helps keep molds clean, which helps gives us a consistent, good record. And what is, what's this thing right here? This is the heat exchanger. Oh. So you can see the the orange pipe is the hot water coming back from the presses. 
going through and then it'll exit out the bottom and go along that smaller pipe back to the process tank and then the, the bigger gray pipes here this is the water coming from the tower so it'll be cold water and it'll go through this side of the heat exchanger and back out and back up to the cooling tower where then the water gets cooled down Where's this thing over here? These are all filters because, again, we're trying to keep that water as clean as we can. Um, be able to make more and better records. That's a good idea. That's what we want. More Cons and better records. We Cons want more consistency better records. is the goal. So, right. Flat records. We don't want more records. Oh, no. Flat records. This, this is this other building, this is the sugar beet building here? Uh, it was kind of part of the complex. Yeah. You can actually get a decent shot of the back of it. Very yeah. ornate for, you know. Well, they added all of the steel structure around it in the early 90s after the Northridge earthquake in 94. Oh. Oh. Uh, and so it kind of ruined the look of the building, but. Oh, I see. Yeah, I did. They, they painted it a good color, so it kind of camouflaged. Yeah, it kind of blends it. in, but sure would have looked a lot nicer if they did it on the inside. True. But I guess but, they weren't that concerned about aesthetics. No. <laughs> no. Yeah. We actually have about 30,000 square feet. It's a little bit under that. Um, and we've, we've built everything out with the idea of being able to expand. Okay. So here we are. Then we're in the pressing room. We'll turn, close that door, yeah. get a little better lighting. Yep. But while we're back here too, so all of the piping, this was something really nice. I was actually able to design this. We first started talking with an engineering company and they wanted to do some wild things that wouldn't have worked for record pressing. Yeah. So How would they know? <laughs> yeah, they don't know. Uh, so I took it on myself to uh, kind of learn, learn some things and figure it all out. But so we, yeah, we designed everything with record pressing in mind um, to be able to make consistent good records. So we'll, we'll come around up front there. Right now, we only have the five five running currently. Okay. Um, so these machines are manufactured by uh, RPM. RPM is what they're called, record pressing machines. They're out of uh, Nashville, Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, he, the, the owner, and he's the one that does most of the work as well. Uh, him and his son work there, and then he contracts some uh, electricians to do some of the programming and wiring. And he comes out of uh, Southern Machine Shop, the SMT, is that Yeah, his, uh, his father worked at a or owned a machine shop that did a lot of the work on the original SMTs. So he already had access to a lot of the original drawings, yeah. um, had a familiarity with them. Uh, he also worked for a short time at United Record Pressing, where he got to learn more about how the machine uh, could work, I guess. And so these are, new, these are more recently designed machines. These are not so, like old, old machines rebuilt? No, no, they, yeah, everything is brand new on them. But uh, even the design? Yeah, the basic design is the same as yeah. the original SMT. Uh, we can go, actually, we'll kind of open this one up just so we can get a better look at it. Well, so, it all opens up very cleanly. You can get right in. Yeah, right so this is, the, this is how we change out stampers, uh, clean the stampers if needed, etc. cetera. Um, but this is really probably the most important part of it's these SMTs. Right? That's the hydraulic, cylinder. hydraulic cylinder. So I think all of the new presses, if I'm not mistaken, have very small, like six or eight inch uh, rams. Yep. And then they'll have a platen maybe this size or thinner. And believe it or not, under the, the force that's required to press a record, which is about 100 tons, this platen will actually bend. Yours will, right? Uh, no, even ours would. Oh, wow. But since we have a full 12 inch diameter cylinder, that's taking up basically the space of that record. So over that 12 inches, you're gonna have zero deflection. That makes sense. Yeah. So that's why we believe these are gonna give you the, the best, more, most accurate reproduction of a, uh, on a record that you can get. Most accurate molding. And how hard is it to change out of tool? You just undo those bolts? 
then... Yeah, so there's a ring that holds on the stamper, and then there's a, a center, a center that holds down the center of it. Okay. So it, it's fairly easy to do. Uh, that's, especially when I'm training somebody here, you know, everything here is really easy to do, but you have to make sure it's done right, and there's a lot of moving parts, so it's... You don't uh, want your hand getting caught in there. Oh, no, no, no. And Yeah, when these are open, the press actually won't even turn on if you have the door open. Yeah. So no matter good. what I do, you can't even turn on the on the motor to be yeah, able to make it go up. That's good. It's a good, good feeling, right? Yeah. And then, so, so, but the basic, yeah, and then the basic uh, automation of the press. So we're kind of starting at the, the wrong end. This is the, the trim side, so this is where the record gets trimmed after it's pressed. Um, the basic concept is the same. Uh, probably one of the biggest improvements is that we're using um, their hybrid, hybrid stepper motor, hybrid stepper motors, servo motors. Uh, and we're able to really, really accurately place everything within about two, two ten thousandths of an inch. Okay, let's go to the back of the machine, and then later on we'll get to see everything running together. Okay. So the material will be loaded in. Uh, we, so we have a, an automated loading system, so that way we don't have to manually load the presses. Uh, I want to keep all of our operators focused on pressing records, not on making sure the presses have vinyl to right. be able to press records. I want them paying attention out there. So the loader will load this all the way up with vinyl up to about here. And this will feed down into the extruder. And it'll feed down through here. And it'll extend out here into the, we have a cup that comes down and we'll fill up, fill up that cup with vinyl. And that's your, that's the birth of the record, really. That's your puck. Or the conception. Yes. It's the, the conception of the record at that point. And you really want to make sure you have a really nice, even, consistent biscuit. And that's one of the big changes between the old SMT presses and this new one that Greg designs. Uh, it makes a very, very nice, consistent, even biscuit. Uh, and we'll see this all on our running press later. Uh, but after it's formed, it'll come over into the center here. We'll have labels that are picked up and put on these arms here. And the labels and the biscuit will come over. Our pen will shoot up, which will keep the, keep the labels and the puck together. All of the arms will go back, and then this comes up and squeezes the bejesus out of it. Uh, well, not quite yet. We're just just enough to make it a little shorter, so oh, okay. we'll make it out in the press, okay, then. and then it'll kind of temporarily attach the labels, okay. and then it'll be get ejected out into the press where it'll be pressed. Uh, but the really nice thing about this and the labels, again, they're all controlled by those hybrid stepper motors. Right, and, here, right here. Yeah. So we're able to very, very, very precisely. Uh, place those labels. So it's, this is not a lot of manual uh, oversight of that part of it. It's pretty no, it's all consistent. automated. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so they're able to be very, very precisely placed, which means we get really, really nice, clean labels. Uh, the split labels, uh, or the you know the inside of the label being messed up from one of the pins hitting it, yeah. is almost a thing of the past. Unfortunately, there's still some variance in the label manufacturing, so a little bit will still happen. Now, what about the issue that, that sometimes plagues pressing plagues, which is that the something slips, the die slips, or the tool slips, and one side gets pressed off center? Oh, yeah. So that's the the centering is probably probably one of the hardest things to be able to get right. Not because any one thing's hard, but because there's so many different variables yeah. and being able to get that record centered. Yeah. So it all starts with the cutting engineer cutting that lockout groove. Right. So I guess, I've never really seen one that's been off center, but it's possible. Um, and that's how we gauge, or everything's gauged 
after that to be on center. So your stampers show up here ready to go onto the press, correct? Because it, 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 the plating and the... Correct, yeah, they're already formed and... Stamper prep yeah. is done. Yeah, so if the stampers are punched off center, I can't do anything about right. that. It's gonna be, it's gonna be what it is. Right. Um, so those have to be right. And generally, the best I think I've ever seen consistently is about four to five thousandths uh, eccentricity. Yeah. So already you're kind of starting at a disadvantage of being able to get it, you know, dead perfect. perfect. You're never going to... The whole process of record making and playing back is not perfect. It's not perfect. And the fact that it still sounds so unbelievably great and better yeah. than almost anything is amazing. Yeah. yeah. Record. Yeah. If you want a perfect record, they're called CDs. CDs. Exactly. They don't sound that good, but, but, but they're, they're perfect. perfect. Exactly. We're uh, on the same page. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we have the stampers that have to be on center, and then maybe we'll go back to the front again. Do <laughs> here. Okay, I'll follow you. Okay. So then we have the two molds, and so you have one side of the record on one side and one side of the record on the other. Right? Uh, the centering is going to be based on the bottom. Um, and so it's generally the top one, at least on our machines, where you'll have it can be more off-center. Right. Um, but yeah, so the, the molds need to be as close to a uh, perfect alignment as we can get. And you can probably see how that can be an issue uh, because we have the ram which has to be centered. We have the platen that has to be centered. We have the uh, bolster plate, we call it, which has to be centered. We have the, the molds that has to be centered. Right. And then we have to have the stamper that has to be right. centered. And that's just one side. So then you flip it over onto the other side and you have to get those to line up and be perfect. And what are this chain of? Oh, so that's how we operate the, the center, so we can uh, remove the center and tighten it down. I see. Okay. So, but we, so, not a daily occurrence, but every couple weeks, you know, the, the, the centering might creep up a little bit, so we'll have to go in and adjust that. So we get out dial indicators and get it adjusted as close as we can to perfect. Okay. Let me show you real quick the loading system, just okay. the vinyl and et cetera. So we get all of our standard vinyl in the, the bag, super sacks of vinyl. Uh, any specialty vinyl we'll get in bags, colors, uh, if we're using a different type so of compound. This is, which compound is this right here? So this is uh, the super vinyl. Okay. Um, and so we get that in bags and have, we still have to pick these up and fill it in or load it up into something else. Uh, empty one. All the empty bags. And this but, is the standard compound here? Yeah, this is the standard, uh, standard black compound. And those come in, it's a, that's a big, that's one big bin of it right there? Or they yeah, so it's a metric ton. Wow. 2,205 pounds. And so we'll actually unload it into these containers here. Uh, I'm a little bit, Picky. So I don't want things like whatever this is that fell in the vinyl. Yeah. It looks like a hair from one of my dogs. Oh, it might be. It looks like a little piece of wood or something like that almost. But so we try we keep everything covered up. We'll fill it up, uh, fill these containers up. It also makes it consistent where we don't have to come over here and mess with the vinyl. We're able to have our lances go right in there and it will suck right up through the through the piping to the presses. And you press exclusively black vinyl here. No, we do. do we, we've done some colors as well. We actually have a pretty good job coming up for, it's going to be a translucent orange. Sure. Actually, it's kind of a cool, uh, a cool reject record we have up there of one of the blue, blue ones we did a little while ago. Can you say who it's for or you know what it's like? It was for a local artist. Oh, okay. so. how, small, how small a run will you do for somebody? What was that? How small a run will you do? We, we don't want to really do less than 500. Yeah. And it's not because we don't want to help anybody out or anything. It's just if you go below 500, it costs the same pretty much as right. it does to do 500. Yep. So it just doesn't really make economic sense. And we don't want to 
perpetuate this idea that you can press 100 records and be successful at it. So a large part of the, of the cost is the initial setup getting the press set up, that's a lot of Well, getting the cutting done, getting the stampers made, getting a test pressing done. Yeah, and then once you're boom, 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 it's not that expensive. Yeah, it's not that expensive. But if you get it wrong, it's very expensive. Yes. And I mean, and then, you know, so we have to spend half hour to an hour setting up a press to be able to run a job. Yeah. And so if we're only gonna run it for an hour, we, we have to build a customer that okay. extra time you. So it, it turns, it gets expensive. Yep. Um, so I think I think that's kind of everything out here. How did this beautiful green thing get? get, get Th that happened during shipping. Oh. So Let's get some paint painted up, make everything look so beautiful. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I I think we did a pretty good job of making it look pretty nice yeah, in here. Yeah, it really does. And again, I'm a little picky, so I try to keep everything as clean as I can. Yeah. Um, I get some pushback every once in a while because I insist on keeping the doors closed as well. Which is a good idea. But yeah, we don't want a bunch of dust and debris coming right. in here. That's for other places. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, we're here for the records. The records aren't here for us. So. Exactly. What, what's next? Uh, well, I guess we'll watch the machine running. You have a Soviet era car over there in the corner? Is that what that is? What no, I'm... no, that's a Datsun. Oh, it is? Yeah, 1970 uh, Datsun Roadster. We'll go look at that later. Yeah, I've had it. I've had it for seven years. I'm going to start working on it any day. Uh, okay, what's next? So let's go look at a, a press that's actually running. So these are running the, the super vinyl. And so we'll load it into these containers here. Uh, just because we're not, we don't need the big containers of it here. Yep. We're still loading it. Uh, and so I actually have a shared system just for these presses running the super and vinyl. when it starts running, when it's getting close to being running out of pellets, it stops automatically or you, you, your guy has to look well, at it? We have a, the control system is over there. And so if it tries to fill twice and it doesn't uh, fill up, it'll set an alarm. And so we, we have enough time to be able to, to catch it before it so becomes a, a problem. Yeah. A lot of yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've, we could talk more about the automation later. Okay. Uh, I just, uh, maybe my philosophy behind that. And so this is the press actually running. We'll start it on the next full system. Yeah. So in a moment, we're gonna see the compression plate, we call it drop down. At the same time, the labels, about the same time, the labels will come up and get picked up. The biscuit cup came down, and so now we're forming that biscuit. There it is. There's your biscuit that's moving over. Now it's coming over. Everything's combining. Now we're going to squeeze that. And again, the idea is just to make it small enough to go out into the press and kind of temporarily attach those labels. Yep. I don't know if you want to try to follow along. So once that opens, it'll drop the drop the biscuit with the labels and everything on there. And so all this while the press is actually heating up, it's continuing to heat. Once it's fully formed, uh, the heating will stop and then we'll turn on the cooling. So that should be happening a few seconds ago. And so now it's cooling down. Uh, we cool it down to about 120, 130 degrees. So it's still, it comes out of the press fairly warm still. Uh, and if we cool it down too much, it'll actually stick to the mold a little bit. And that's one of the ways that you can get stitching, actually. Okay, and then the next one's ready to go in already. Yep. You can get a nice shot through here, too. Just because this does move back and forth. So watch your, watch your fingers, is what you're saying. Oh yeah, look at that. Okay. It'll just bump you. So now the cooling's almost done. There, there's the record. So now it'll it come out. out. It comes out, it doesn't get perfectly placed out here. So we'll drop it and then extend the pen down to be able to center that record up so it'll trim nice and even. So we also burnish all of our records. Oh. So we get that nice smooth edge on the outside. Like press roll used to get. Yeah, I would love to say that it makes a record sound a million times better, 
but it just it feels so it feels much better, better when in your you hand it up. and that, that counts all this you, know, you, don't, you don't have to uh, get cut or anything uh, so it'll trim and then it gets picked up by the arm and dropped there How often do you have to change the blade? Um, not that often, actually. Because it's, it's soft, right? It, it's soft. It is pretty abrasive, the plastic is. Yeah. Um, so, and these ones are rotating, so it really uh, wears out evenly, and it, it's actually quite a lot of cutting surface. The burnishing blades, we do have to sharpen you know, maybe once a month. Well, how many records do you put on here before you put the... the, the Normally we'll do five, but uh, you were in my way, so I couldn't get it. Oh, so whoever gets the sixth record, if there's a problem, it's my fault. Okay, yep. fine. Thank there you, you go. No blame, problem. Blame me. Okay. <laughs> no, so yeah, we do them every five records. That's just to keep an easy count. And that's a manual job. Someone's got to come over and do it. Yeah. So actually, I have some automation I've been working on that's going to eliminate that, so it'll automate all of that for us. Um, the one nice thing about it is it does kind of force somebody to come and look at the record though. Yeah. And so that's, I'm trying to free people up because we do spend a lot of time stacking these, yep. but I'd like to free somebody up to be able to actually inspect the records. And how long does it take for the record to really cool down so it's, you know. So we let them cool overnight, so minimum of 12 hours, uh, up to 24 hours, we'll let them cool. Uh, you'd probably be okay anything after about eight hours to sleeve them, but we we wait. I mean, it just kind of makes sense too. We'll press them one day, the next day we'll sleeve them. Does the relative low humidity around here help it at all, or is it irrelevant? Um, I don't think especially. It's actually uh, we're we're pretty close to the ocean. We're about. Uh, right. Four miles, five miles away from the ocean. Right. So we actually have a little bit higher humidity. We're usually around 60%. And you got some ozone in, around here too from the ocean. Is that true? Yeah, a little bit. It doesn't affect your rubber parts? No. We're far enough away from the ocean. Uh, yeah, the only thing that really affects is when you actually have really low humidity um, and you start getting a little With our low humidity, usually comes wind. And so we get a lot of static buildup, yeah, I was say static, yeah. and that that can cause some issues. Um, but we're able to mitigate that. We just have to be aware and prepared for well, it. How many records do you press on a given stamper? I mean, you're not pressing huge numbers anyway. No, it's going to vary. Um, you know, we try to get at least a thousand records out of a stamper. That makes sense. Um, you know, there's a lot of theories about how long a stamper will last. And what we do is we go until the stamper, uh, at you. Yeah, me up, well, me. it'll start, you know, we can start picking up on small things, yeah. but generally the issue with the stampers being run for so long is you will get some damage as they're being run. And so you start getting scratches, scuffs on the stampers. So as soon as something like that happens, we put a new stamper on. I think it would be interesting if you could, you know, when you get a new stamper in there, take the first record, press off, and then take the last record before you change it and give it to somebody to listen to and see if they can hear a difference in it. Well, yeah, you can't tell them, right? No, <laughs> you gotta be double blind. Yeah, double. I, we've, uh, actually the first record will probably sound worse. Th that's what I was, yeah, if you're, you yeah. have to get going before. Kinda have to get everything worn in. Yep. Uh, a lot of the times there'll be a little bit of dirt or debris embedded in the stamper that gets pulled out. Uh, I mean, we're talking microscopic, but it's there. Well. Yeah, my rule is if you're standing in front of the press, you have to stack it. So I'm just trying to abide by my own rule. And you got to do it right. In, you got to do it just in time, like that. You can't. Yeah. Well, I got. So actually, I did a boo-boo on that. You can see my fingerprint right there. You can get rid of that, right? Well, I could, but I'm gonna make some record collectors angry somewhere. Oh no! We're gonna throw it away.
then you'll regrind that and use it again, yeah. right? Because that's just, I mean, it's virgin vinyl. Yeah, yeah, it's still clean vinyl. Well, we'll talk about that too, because we do uh, try to recycle everything that we can. Yep. Uh, you, pop, you pop out the center, right? Get rid of the... Yeah. In the most, uh, if not efficient, uh, responsible way, Especially for the listener, because that, that's one of the things that'll, I think, separate now, us. does the color of that cloth make a difference to the sound? That one over there is purple, and that one's kind of... Uh, they're, they're, they're tuned into each machine. Each machine has its own, uh, own, own personality, so you have to find the one that works best for so That's Gatorade, and that's uh, yeah. purple patch. Yeah. We're just kidding. Great Kool-Aid. So that's how we... We keep track of everything right now on the TV screen there. It's still, uh, we're working on a, a full software system, but for now that works. So, I don't know, is there anything else you wanted to see on the machines? It's kind of the same thing times six. And they're all pretty much the same. It's just Yeah. They do all, I mean, I joked about it a minute ago, but they all do kind of have their own personalities. Yes. They all react a little devices. bit differently. Yep. So, you know, you kind of have to tune in each one to work the best way that they can. The, uh, the, the granulating room. The granulating room. Let's talk about what goes on here. And so this is where we recycle all of the, the flash and the reject records. Um, we have our, our punching machine over there which is a pretty nifty piece of kit here. We're able to, to automatically punch out the records. We just load them up on there, and as long as everything's working properly, it'll just punch them out for us. And then you have coasters. And we have coasters. But you I can't have, sell them, though, because they're copyrighting. Yeah, I have some up front for you. Uh, so we run um, two different granulators, one for the super vinyl, one for the, the standard vinyl. Um, it will turn it back into the same little pellet that yeah, it's a little bit different, but similar. I see. So we run it through, we have a de-duster, which removes all of the fines, which right. is one of the issues that you can have with uh, running the regrind. Right. And so you can see all the, the fines gathered up in the bag there. And so that can cause the vinyl to get burned when it gets re, uh, run back through. Because it's not, not melting at the same time. Yeah, it'll melt too quickly, yep. overheat. So the key is just doing it correctly. And yeah. Then you don't have issues. Doing it correctly, uh, keeping everything clean, separated. You don't want to be mixing vinyl because that causes a lot of issues. Yep. Um, and then and, what is this? And so this is the one we use for Super Vinyl or VR900. Okay, it's or, the same machine, essentially. It's the same machine, yeah. Different color. Um, I like these ones, and I like trying to keep the equipment the same so we have minimal parts. We don't have to keep a bunch of extra parts on hand. Yep. We can just have one set. Um, also, people are familiar with them. So we actually, you know, so as we're sleeving the records, we hand inspect one, which we'll go see in a moment. And then when we punch them back out and regrind them, we're also hand inspecting all of them again. Uh, to make sure we don't get any paper or debris or anything like that. Okay, next. Next, let's go into packaging. So, how much room do you have here to? If you were, if you were to add presses, they would come out. They would come out this way. Yeah. So we actually have everything built out already. You can see the valves up on top, and so we can add 12 more machines right here. How far would it take it out? out to it would be right out to. The last one would be about right here. So then you would have a total of uh, 12. 12, 12 total. Yeah. yeah, that's big enough, right? Yeah, yeah. That's, I don't. We could go more, but I don't want to. No. Because uh, my focus is on quality. Our focus is on quality, and growing too much is going to compromise that. Yep. So after the records are pressed, they, they sit here for overnight. Yeah. So we'll set them on here overnight. Um, actually, the. So all the spacers and the spindles, we, we actually made ourselves. Oh. Um, just, you can't, you can't go to the store and buy these, right? Surprise. Yeah. So even down to the handles. We couldn't find handles that would work, so we made our own. So we'll store them here overnight. Um, and then we have them on the rack so they're easy to move. We don't have to uh, have a bunch of carts or anything like that. 
Right. And we only have the one packager right now, and so she's actually working on the, the bagging. What we do, this is the sleeving stations, so we'll actually hand inspect each and every record. Um, this is where I like to try to get away from the automation because I think it's important to have that human eye yeah. on these and be able to inspect them. Uh, we're looking to do things in the future with some cameras and being able to help, but we, I don't think we can ever go away from having that human eye on the record and yep. handling the record. So you're not really sleeving any records at this moment? Not right now, because she's, she's working on that over like, there. I can see what she's doing over yeah, there. Yeah, we'll get over to that. Okay. So same, we'll put them in the, the bins after their sleeves. Okay. And so we just do that to keep them contained, keep track of them, uh, keep them protected. They'll go on the racks here. And we'll jack it, jack at the record. Um, I mean, this video probably wouldn't come out for a couple weeks, right? Yes. So we could probably show you this one at least. Uh, so actually we just finished these up uh, last night, uh, getting them all, um, all jacketed and everything. There's a great Paul so that's Simon documentary that you can watch on, uh, it's on Apple TV or M MG, no, it's on MGM. It's Alex Gibney did this uh, very long Paul Simon oh, okay. biography. It's, it's really wonderful. Yeah. So this is one that we actually, it was done on Super Vinyl. And promos, who's getting the promos? I don't, that's not my job. Yeah. 40 <laughs> promos, 22 promos. Someone's getting a lot of promos. Okay. Well, so, someone's on the MoFi gravy train. It must be me. Okay. Yep. Uh, and so after we jacket them, right now we only have the bagger operational, uh, but so we're poly bagging these. And these ones, we actually go to great lengths uh, to actually keep everything in order. And so even these jackets, you get, a, well, these don't matter, but we number all of them. And so we keep track of everything sequentially. Right there, right there, they're numbered. And where does, where does that, is that, who stamps the numbers? We do that here as well. By hand or is there a machine? So we have a machine right there. Like right here? Oh yeah, there's yeah. yeah. So, but we keep them all order in order sequentially. So they're really what they say they are. Pretty close. Yeah. Not, I'm not going to say they're perfect, right, right. but within probably 100. Okay. They're probably in order. Yeah. Um, and then as we're packaging them, we keep them all sequentially in order. And where does the perforation thing happen? Right here? Uh, it's actually built into the bag. Oh. So we seal, seal the opened in here, and this part gets wasted. And then on the bottom of the bag, we have the perforation there. I see. So we do have a shrink wrapper as well. Uh, I just haven't hooked it up yet, but I'm gonna be working on that. Hopefully by the end of summer, I'll have that up and running. And are all these machines custom made for record pressing? Record? No, these ones, this is actually an off the shelf, uh, off the shelf machine. So the, I think most of, most of the time people are using them to seal be, uh, shirts and things like that. But you yeah. well, can come back, Maria. We're... You know, what's <laughs> interesting is a lot of people don't think about this kind of thing. When they buy a record, they don't consider all this infrastructure, all these machines that have to do all of this to bag a record and put it in a person's got to stand there all day and yeah. do that and it is a lot of work yeah there's I, I think i said this earlier uh you know there's nothing really really hard in record pressing but there's just a lot of things going on all at the same time yep. and you have to have everything working right together yep that machine needs some work like having them deposit into the the bucket yes as opposed to yeah uh, it's not always super easy. Uh, well, we'll do. We'll show you the box chain. It's, okay. It's all part of it. So let's, yeah. let's, let's see it. Oh. There's even a this is Maria. That record. The box chain. Yeah. This is Maria. She's been with us for Hi, three, four months now. Five months. Do you have um, a turntable at home? You do. Do they just flip you a free record? <laughs> they do. So this is, this is another thing you can notice that she's uh, turning everyone 180 sure, degrees yeah. to be able to get them to stack in there nicely. Yeah. And so really with the shipping of the records, you want to keep everything as tight and tight as possible. 
And so we pack them as much as we can, and then we'll generally fill in the extra gap with the cardboard to be able to get a nice compact. Yes. You don't want them moving around. Yeah, that's that's a death knell. It's not it's not even so much the well, it is the side to side, but you need some compression on it yeah. to be able to hold everything. You don't want together. the record moving in this because it splits the same. Right, I've seen that. We've gotten those. Right. So we'll. Uh, or what's this, this? This is. So this is a tape machine. You want me to run it through, Maria? So you're selling tapes also? Oh, no, I see. Oh. <laughs> no cassettes here. Thank you, Maria. So we'll just feed it through and it'll tape the, tape the box for us. Oh, I, I could use one of those. It, help, it helps with uh, saving on labor because we don't have to hand tape them. But yep. more importantly that, it really makes it a nice compact yep. uh, taping job. We'll just do the one, but we'll pack two of these as well into one of the master packs and yep. then we run it through the tape machine again as well yep. and that it's just the best way that i think there is to be able to ship records right now our tc process and we have garfunkel wrong for god's sakes Do you know what's, that? what's that That's, garfunkel isn't spelled that way who did that uh i'm not going to name any names that's wrong don't they want to get it right they should redo all of those Okay, everybody at home, look how they spell Garfunkel. That's the other Jewish spelling. It's K-E-L, not K-L-E. The, the jackets are correct, right? The jackets yes. don't say Garfunkel. Yes, this is just our, our labeling. It's not spelled like that on the jacket. No, it's not. <laughs> I didn't, I, I'm just bust, bust, busting your chops. Busting chops. Yeah. So these are all uh, records that are finished, that are getting ready to go out. Um, so we, just, we have to finish packaging them up. But we generally try to wait until the order's all done, and then we'll go through, get all of the correct shipping information on it, and then you have the wrap it up. We, yeah, we corner, corner guard everything, wrap it with plastic really good to keep everything nice and tight and protected. Um, a lot of records. People just don't understand how many records are going out there. These are not like going to sit on shelves forever. These are no, that yeah, I, yeah. As soon as they, as soon as they get to the warehouse, they'll get shipped out. This is our uh, shrink wrapping machine. So this is one of the nice things I do love about the, the vinyl record industry is, you know, there's, there, we have a lot of competitors out there, but everybody's kind of friends. Yeah. And so we actually got this from Memphis Record Pressing. Huh. Uh, they got all, some all new equipment, but Mark, we helped Mark quite a bit when he was getting everything set up and whatever that was, I like 2014. That. I like that whole aspect of 2015. Everybody so. is helping everybody. It's, yeah. It's, it's, so, yeah. So he, he helped us out a lot with this, uh, getting this out here. And, and we said, well, okay, we're going to send you the payment. He said, don't worry about it until you have it up and going. And this is the shrink wrap as opposed to using the... Instead of the bag. I mean, yeah. it's going to vary what the customer wants. The customer wants. It's more expensive to do that, to do the bag. Yeah, a little bit. So. And there's your car. There's my car. I'm gonna start working on it any day of the week, any day. Cool. And this okay. is this is our little workshop over here. So we do do all of the maintenance and any repairs. Well, who does all this? upgrades? Like this is me and my brother. Oh, oh, cool. Um, so we kind of this is my brother's area. He does a lot of the machining. So we have a mill and a lathe, a bunch of machining tools and equipment. I do more electrical, welding, fabricating that sort of thing. So, and you, you kind of have to be able to do all of that yeah. to be able to run a record plant because... Or you have to call an outside guy to come in from Gold Star or whatever. <laughs> yeah, and they don't know what they're doing. No, and then they want to charge you a lot of money. They, well, they don't know what they're doing for record, record pressing. Yes. So we, uh, I mean, all the construction we had done by a contractor, but a lot or pretty much all of the equipment installed. Who, who, did, who did the work on your, who designed your logo and all that? That, that was actually my wife. Really? Yeah. She did a great job. Great. Yeah. Does she have a history of doing that? Of doing that? Yeah. So she went to. Uh, she has a, a degree in industrial design. Oh. And she did that until she decided to become a stay-at-home mom. So she actually homeschools our three kids. So she takes most of her time is taken up with that, but she helps out here a lot well, as well. That's a big help because that looks great. Yeah. It's a really cool logo. It's it's kind of retro, but it's modern at the same time. And that's exactly what we were going for. That's kind of our 
take on what we want to do as well. And you got it. So we do this with the ones that we QC because we don't want to take a yeah. record press to the day before. So that, that's kind of warm if I touch it, it's warm. And the label area, you can check that. Nice and warm. Oh yeah. But it'll actually, if you don't stack them properly and let them cool, it's you warm. can actually start watching them dish and warp. Wow. So by the time we're done, it's actually holding pretty steady right now. It's starting to develop a little bit of a dish. Yeah, I can see that, I see it. Um, but it'll get worse as it cools more. So a lot of the times when, it, when pressing was become, was really, when the, the industry didn't have enough presses and people were rushing through it, there were a lot of those warpages because they were moving too fast. Well, a lot of places, they just don't let them cool overnight. Yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of reasons for that. So and this is our, our QC room. Ah, a NAD 3020. I love seeing a NAD. Oh, it's, it's a 1020. Yeah, some of this stuff was my dad's old equipment. Yeah. We also have some new stuff though. We use the the Pioneer Pioneer 1000s. I know a lot of people have some hate for the direct drives, but it's no. I, I'm I'm a direct drive person myself. Yeah. It is a necessity for us because we really abuse these things. I get it. We stop them, we start them. So I have we, a direct drive wife. Well, <laughs> okay, no, I, I know. Yeah, we have to stop them when we're trying to find a, find an issue. Sure. So we really beat them up. So before we even actually put it on the turntable normally, we'll inspect it. We have better light out in the press room actually. We'll inspect and we're looking for any visual, visual clues. We're looking for stitching, non-fill, scratches, etc. cetera. Yep. Um, that looks pretty good to me. What do I know? So yeah, everything looks pretty good on this. Um, I don't. It looks see. like a nice finish on there. Yeah, and you can see how the labels are nice and yep. nice and clean, no splitting. And so one of the, and then we'll brush it off just to get any. Yeah. Now you're looking under the microscope. Yeah. So we'll, one of the first things we'll do is we'll check the centering. And so you might look at that and think that it's moving a whole lot. But, but you're, you're way in though. You're way in. Well, yeah, so we're looking at the lead out. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, this is the furthest in that you're gonna get, and so it's gonna be the most off center. And each one of those dashes is one thousandth of an inch. Right. And so it's going from about four to about 10, nine. Of course, the CD would be perfect. It would be perfect. So this is about six thousandths of an inch okay. eccentricity, which means that it's within three thousandths of an inch. Um, so it's a plus minus, plus three minus three. So when you put the stylus in the groove, how much, how much moving am I going to see? I shouldn't you, see you're it. not going to see anything. No. This would be a perfectly centered record. Better be now that we're on. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just get it as far out on the lead out. Yeah, it looks good. And then we'll go ahead and move it up and we'll move it into another spot. What happens to this, this test record? You don't use it. You don't yeah, so we'll, we'll uh, because it's taken off and uh, had a chance to kind of dish, uh, we'll, we'll reject you'll flash it. it. And you flash it. And... Yeah. So that's what we'll do through, and then we'll just check the B side real quick. Yep. Um, we'll check the centering. So usually the bottom is going to be more on center, and so this one's about a four, four thousandths of an inch yep. off center. Um, which again, that's so that means everything's within two thousandths of an inch, which is uh, half the thickness of a sheet of paper. Yep. The, the kind of the industry standard is like twenty or thirty, so we try to keep it under half of that. So what are all these records doing here? Are these, these are so we have some home? we have some file copies of stuff that we've already pressed here and test pressings and things like that um, <clears throat> of things that are in the works. So we keep those on hand to be able to reference back if there are any issues. And then with the test pressings, if there, you know, is a tick or a pop or something, we can go back and reference it. So what it. percentage of the records that you're pressing these days are, are MoFi titles and what percentage are other? The majority of them right now are MoFi. Well, that's good for them. So, yeah. so Jim's happy, he's, pre he's pressing yeah. his own records? Yeah, but we have, we have a lot more capacity. Yep. Um, so we can press a lot more than that. So yeah. how do you, how do you uh, look for business? What do you? 
what do you do? Do you, do you have are you outreach to artists? Yeah, or? so we're uh, we have somebody that's kind of helping with the sales, and they're uh, reaching out to you know local artists, uh, small independent labels. And how price sensitive do you have to be? In other words, are these people shopping around looking for who, who can press the least expensive record, or do the ones that want quality understand they're going to get real? High they, quality? I mean, so a lot of them are shopping around trying to get the best price, and really, when you take into account everything from, you know, shipping, shipping, and all that, we're pretty competitive with oh, with most of the pressing plants, yeah. and so, you know, not being a businessman myself. I was one of the few Jews born without the business gene. Um, so when you uh, calculate your costs, how much you're going to charge per record, how, how, did you, you, you came up with a cost. You, try, you came up with an idea of what it would cost to run a plant, mm -hmm. build a plant, amortize the cost of building the plant, pressing records and charging a certain amount of money you know, for the record delivered, ready to go. And then over time, over a certain period of time, you have to say, well, how did our plan meet the reality of the world, and, and after the first year, or after the first six months, how are we doing? And then do we have to readjust things? Have you found that? To, have you found your, your projections to be reasonably uh, on, you know, on key, or, or, or no? Yeah, they're, they're actually pretty good. We actually... Um, You're going to say that no matter what. Well, but of I course. That. But we went, uh, we went for kind of the, the apocalypse approach, where we kind of went through the worst case scenario of being able to do it and yeah. what's the lowest cost we could do it at. Um, one of the big things that helps us is that rather than relying on a lot of manpower, so you go to a lot of other pressing plants and you know, there's an army of people. Yeah, yeah. Um, thankfully, we had the experience to be able to do a lot of this ourselves. We didn't have to have an army of people and be able to set everything up efficiently enough that yeah. we will never need a lot of people right. were just able to do it. And so in, in, in doing all of this, to the, to the point where you are now, did you make any serious mistakes? Did you have to redo anything at great expense? Probably the worst one so far is we got, well, the, there was such a, such a delay in getting electrical equipment, yeah. uh, getting panels, that before we went all the way through the engineering process, <clears throat> to get everything specced out and approved by the city, we went ahead and ordered the panels. Yeah. Uh, and we ended up ordering the wrong breakers. Uh, and so that ended up setting us back about 20 grand. <laughs> Could you sell them off to somebody else? Yeah, but not for 20 grand. <laughs> oh, no, okay. So we still have them here. We need to sell them off. Uh, yeah, okay. But yeah, so we got the wrong ones. And there was a few, you know, it's things. It's inevitably going to happen. Yeah, there was a few things like that, yeah. some extra expenses. Um, but, I mean, I, I had my dad who's been doing this for 50 years. Yeah, you've been around, I, you've been around the block a few times. Yeah, and, I've, and, had, yeah. I've had yeah, some experience. Still a few mistakes, but. How much more satisfying is it to have your own place that's yours as opposed to, you know, working for somebody else? It must be it, certain headaches involved yeah. in it. But. Well, I like working at Record Tech. I, yeah. I kind of built that place yeah. anyway. So, yeah. so it's kind of like I'm doing it all over again uh, with, with the foreknowledge of what I'm doing, yeah, you know, always I mean, a big help. Yes, yeah. Knowing what you're doing is it always is. a good. Yes. Yeah, it's it, and and I and I think because of that, we've avoided a lot of mistakes. Yeah, we've made a lot of right right decisions. Yeah, you know? great. So, that's good. Yeah. It's, it's all good. Happy with that. that. That's also another thing that's nice about having the you know kind of the the friendly competitive nature. Uh, or friendly competitive people out there you know a lot of people are there to help you out yeah um, so they're willing to give you advice they won't they will give you all their secrets right but they'll give you advice and be able to help you out sure. and so you know we listen to the other people that have been doing this as well or the ones that have recently started up new pressing plants as well in yeah. the recent past and you know we kind of listen to them and mm. listen to the pitfalls that they went through and yeah. And avoided them. Tried to avoid them, and yeah. I think we did a decent job. Uh, the biggest issue is just getting through planning and permitting here yeah. in Oxnard. Great. Okay, have we seen everything? I think we've seen everything, don't you think? We, we didn't show you the Trash Mahal. Is that like the Taj Mahal? The Trash Mahal? Yeah. <laughs> so, California, well, they passed it a while ago where they want to, uh, to reduce carbon emissions. 
they want to reduce food wastes in landfills because they say it produces methane. Funny enough, most of the landfills out here actually capture all of that methane and use it to power, Why not? power their facilities. And so it's kind of, it's really beneficial to use it, but they want it out of the landfills. So because of that, we had to build this ridiculous trash enclosure. This makes me realize how warm it's getting in. Oh yeah, it'll get warm. Yeah. So this is our trash mahal. <laughs> Just this right here added about 10% to our construction budget. Wow. And, but you knew about this early on, right? No, 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 no. They slapped us with this right at the last second. Ah, great. And said, oh, by the way, you need to do this if you want to get this approved. Ah. Uh, so it's just, it's just your basic trash enclosure, but it's just so overbuilt. And we had to have a space for our food waste that we don't produce. Yeah, what's in here? Nothing's in here, right? Just, yeah, well, that's our trash. And then we have a recycling back behind you. What's this here? This is uh, uh, that's uh, used uh, or hydraulic. not used hydraulic fluid for the presses. So, yeah. how much of that do you go through a year? No, we shouldn't go through anything. Yeah. Uh, this is just we filled it and we're we need to call back the oil company and pick up the empty, empty barrels. barrels. Yeah. Oh, they're empty barrels. Okay. Yeah, they charge us you know twenty bucks or something. Yeah. You can set up a shuffleboard court here. You could. Yeah. There's a lot you could set up here. A tennis you could put a tennis court in here. Come on, basketball hoop at least. Basketball hoop, right? You could. But again, you have to give the workers some, some recreation, right? That's not part of California laws? I guess not. Okay, so we've seen everything at this point, right? Yep, pretty much. Like people are interested. They want to see, especially you know, all the MoFi people that are buying these records, they want to see where the records are being pressed now. I think it's really cool. They want to see you spelling a, <laughs> a Garfunkel incorrectly. How dare you? But that's okay. As long as you get it right on the jacket, it's all that matters. All right, we're talking to Jim Davis, who, of course, he's got a, he's got a record label. He's got a, a hi-fi equipment distribution company. He, he manufactures uh, hi-fi equipment. And uh, frankly, uh, the p pieces that I've reviewed uh, knocked it out of the park because he hired the, the right people to do it, which, which was a good thing. And now you've got a pressing plan that you, you are in business with these guys, correct? Right. I'm not, it's not my business what the deal is, but that seems like a pretty good deal. Well, they are partners. partners. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, just like you said, you've got to find, you know, to make the best electronics, you've got to find the best people to do it, and these are the best people to make records with. Yeah. Uh, anybody who starts a record pressing plan and doesn't have people with this kind of experience uh, running that plant, building it, um, you're kind of doomed to either failure or mediocrity. Or spend a lot of money getting to, getting to that yeah, point. Yeah. And uh, these guys have decades of experience and uh, they're the best. And has it worked out, you, like you're sitting here right now and it's, what is this, June, end of June 2024. Is everything that you have here, is it like what you envisioned it would be and working the way you ex expected it to work? Uh, I think so, yeah. It took a long time to get here. We actually started this process three years ago. Yeah. Uh, is when we first started uh, a little bit over three years ago. We started talking about this. We uh, finally, we bought this building two years ago. Uh, and then it took quite a long time to get all the permits uh, and uh, together so we could do it. So that took about a year. Uh, then construction started uh, about a year ago and um, uh, you know, proceeded. We had to do building work. And then, of course, we had to install the presses and all the, the boilers and all the other... Uh, 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 parts of the plant, uh, so basically we are able to start uh, test pressing uh, records uh, in December, and uh, yeah, now as you can see, we've got uh, our six presses up and running, yeah. and they're new and they're nice and they absolutely really yeah. really well. Everything everything is really nice and fresh and new and yeah. I, I, unlike plants that have a lot of old presses, I mean it's going to require a lot less maintenance. Yeah, uh, computer controlled. Um, and um, I, I think that it, the consistency uh, of the quality is what will be, I think, different and put us, uh, it, it will define our, our part of this business. Yeah. Uh, I think we'll be able to put out consistently great records. Now, you know, every record that comes off a of press, uh, no matter how good the plan is, there's always going to be a, a stinker, right, of every course. once in a while. Uh, but it's the overall consistency that I think um, will be the best. 
and it already is, I imagine, you're, you're seeing that already. The reason yeah, I, th I think that the, the stuff that's come off this, uh, these presses so far uh, is great quality. Uh, we're seeing uh, quieter, no you know, uh, less noisy pressings, I think, than maybe we had before. Not that we were known for noisy pressings. No, you were uh, Yeah, but uh, I think that they're even better than the pressings that we had before. Yeah. That's good. That's what you want. Right. right. I, I, I want as least amount of problems as possible. Right. <laughs> you know, I, I, Just you know. being in this business, there are problems. But, right. But the least is best. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's good. Anything else you want to say about all of this? It's, it's uh, well, it's been a it's a it's 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 time consuming. It's uh, you know it's been it's frustrating times trying to get these things uh, together. Uh, but I'm definitely glad that we're we're off and running. And uh, I expect to, you know, see uh, us get a lot of, of business here in the future. Uh, you know, we had a, an open house here that was extremely well received. Yeah, I'm sorry, I couldn't be at that, but I, I couldn't. <laughs> and uh, and I do expect that uh, we'll see uh, quite a, business, a bit of business, uh, despite the fact that um, uh, that the industry uh, at, in general now has an overcapacity yeah, of, yeah. of pressing. Uh, but I think most of that over that overcapacity is concentrated at the lower end of yeah. the quality scale, uh, and there's always room for plants that do high quality. Yeah, it's the same with hi-fi. There's yeah. always room for companies making really good hi-fi. Right. As long as we don't think we have to have 50 presses here. Exactly. Right. <laughs> we we we'll just uh, stick with our you know with a small number of presses, but do it right. Yeah. Max of t max of 12. You said that that that's the max if it ever gets to that point. Right now we can expand to 12 pretty easily. Right. We have all the infrastructure yeah. uh, in place. Uh, theoretically, we can go to 16 in this location. Oh. Uh, would require us to get another boiler and and some other things. Uh, we're only limited uh, to 16 in this location because of the um, uh, natural gas supply. Yeah, but that should be that should be plenty. <laughs> I think that's going to be plenty. Yeah, you, you got enough to do, right? Right. <laughs> okay, thanks, man. Thanks All for right. writing me. All right, you're welcome.